Good afternoon. Welcome to this old museum. Good to see everybody here. Uh, we are very grateful to the class of 1950 for their continual support for our lecture series. Steve Thomas is best known as the host of PBS's This Old House and Discoveries, Renovation Nation. But the other track in his life has been ocean voyaging and navigation. After college, he crewed on racing yachts, was first mate on schooners and other vessels. And by 31 years of age, he had already logged more than 30,000 blue water uh, miles as a professional navigator and skipper. In 1983 and 84, he undertook an ambitious project to study traditional oceanic star path navigation on the remote Micronesian island of Sadawal and Mau Pilag. Pialag. Pialag. No, <laughs> Last of the fully initiated star path navigators, or Palu. Over the course of two years of field work, he learned Sadawalese and was trained in secret navigational lore not taught to any Westerner. He also makes an excellent martini. <laughs> I can attest to that. Um, Steve, welcome to the Naval Academy Museum. It's a pleasure having you. So we'll give a talk. We'll have, we hope to have some time for questions. If you need to know about putting a second story on your house, we're going to stick with the last mariner because I've already tapped him out for everything I need for my place. Thanks, Steve. Thank you. Thank you all very much. It, it is a uh, pleasure and an honor to speak here. Uh, my uncle, who's on the right, flew Corsairs in the Battle of Marianas, so he got in right at the tail end of the war. My dad, who's on the left, you can tell by the big glasses there, he said, I tried to bribe this doctor in San Pedro with every buck I had, but he still wouldn't let me into the Navy. So he, was, he wanted to get into the Navy. He ended up in... Uh, uh, the Solomon Islands on uh, what he realized then was a tanker filled with avgas refueling PT boats that were going operating in the slot and he's sitting there smoking a cigarette and he said I finally realized that I'm sitting on a bomb so that was uh, that was uh, there is uh, a lot of Navy in my background of course everybody knows that I was on this old house renovation nation uh, I did do a bunch of films for the uh, History Channel and did a couple of, on veterans uh, one, we flew B-25s around Southern California and put the crew of a B-25 back on board, including um, Dick Cole, who was Jimmy Doolittle's co-pilot. Mm -hmm. Talking to those guys is really a privilege. And then we also did one up in the Aleutian Islands as well. Uh, so I grew up in Southern California. We were talking uh, earlier before the talk. And so I started surfing and sailing when I was a kid, 10 years old. I bought my first surfboard, bought a, a little dinghy when I was 14. And then went off to the Med, well, after college raced out to Hawaii, sailed about back to uh, Seattle, then went off to the Med and became first mate of this boat, here pictured in Boston, 103 foot schooner, a couple other boats. And then I took a 43 foot sloop from England to San Francisco down through the canal to the Galapagos, Marquesas, uh, back up to Hawaii and back across to San Francisco. So this is 1978 maybe, Evie, I'm looking at my wife. We met in 79, so it was 70, 78 or 79? 79. 79. So it was before GPS. Uh, it was really before SatNav. There was one Loran chain in the Pacific, and that was it. So it was, you know, it was sextant. It was traditional Western navigation techniques. Sextant, I had a digital watch that was really fancy. And I became interested in traditional Micronesian and Polynesian techniques on that voyage. Uh, what happens when I lost the rotator to my taffrail log, and I had one spare that I wanted to save for going into San Francisco. So I started just judging the speed of the vessel by eye. And I found that I could really, I was pretty accurate. Um, so I said, wow, maybe I could actually learn these techniques. I uh, did some research, found that there were really only five islands on which the techniques were still practiced. Um, up on the, in the middle of the Micronesian chain here, there's these five little islands right in the middle here that uh, still practice the techniques. And um, so, uh, you know, I did a year of preliminary research, uh, got some grants, one from the Wintergren Foundation, a couple other companies gave me a little bit of money and off I went. The guy I wanted to study with was Mao Pialig, who was the most famous of the navigators. He was also the youngest of the fully initiated Palu. And the reason I wanted to study with him was that he was, uh, you know, he got the whole value proposition of you know teaching to a Westerner because he was worried about the future of navigation. So he'd done the Hokulea and here it is. Let's see where's 
3,000 miles across waters he'd never sailed before. 40 days without sight of land, yet his daily estimates of position were never more than 40 miles off. Many nights, it was cloudy, without even the stars to guide him. So off I went to Sattawal Island. Um, I was, you know, I mean, you can't call the guy up or text him. So you know, <laughs> I show up with a bunch of sailcloth and a bunch of nails and a bunch of cigarettes and a bunch of booze. That I figured that would sort of cover it all. And it did. And I was surprised at how willingly he taught me. Um, I mean, he taught me immediately. He jumped right into it. Uh, he's, he kind of knew who I was because I'd worked on another documentary film. Uh, that was a PBS special, so I'd communicated with him a little bit. But you know, all the anthropologists in the field said, you know, it's going to take months for you to earn their trust. And the first day, he's saying, okay, you got to jump right in, and you know, uh, we're going to, I'm going to teach you. He taught me with his urgency, as if he knew that he didn't have a long time to teach this stuff, and and that turned out to be the case. So he installed me in his village, a Sukalap village. Uh, there were some feasts. And so it was like stepping back to Cook or to uh, Charles Wilkes, uh, who did a Navy expedition out there from 1838 to 42. And so you see this uh, orange color. This is actually turmeric. And orange is the color of light, which is the color of wisdom. The seat of knowledge is the solar plexus, or the stomach. And the, the color orange is supposed to bring knowledge uh, and wisdom into, your, in the, into the seat of the knowledge. Of course, there's other attractive aspects about dancing, you know, girls who have no tops, and that sort of goes without saying. Um, this is, this young woman actually married a friend of mine who was a Saddle Lee's guy who helped me translate all the very most secret of the, the Etong, which I'll show you in just a second. So the rising and setting points of 15 stars or constellations are what sets out the star compass. So we all know that the stars rise four minutes earlier every night, but they arc through the same path through the sky and they set. So the rising and setting points do change a little bit, uh, but not much with latitude. In the latitude range in which these guys operate, there's really no variation. So the rising Milap or Altair in the east breaks the horizon, arcs through the sky, sets as the setting uh, Altair. And they <coughs> indicate this as Tana Milap rising, Tabula Milap setting, North Star doesn't move. It's seven degrees north, so you can just barely see the North Star. Uh, that's straight north. And then the Southern Cross describes five positions rising 45 degrees upright and then setting in the same array there. So this, that gives rise to this idea of star paths arcing through the sky. And then theoretically, if you were to leave your departure island and point, in, point the bow of your boat at the uh, target island, and there was no leeway, and you steered perfectly, there was no drift, and so on, you could follow the rising Altair and hit your target island. Of course, that's never the case, but that's the concept. Now, this is taught in a, to very young kids. I mean, as soon as you can walk, you start learning the stars. And it's taught in something called, uh, uh, this, this lesson is called Merikeki, which is unfolding the mat. And here's how that looks. The very next day, he began teaching me the names and positions of the guiding stars. He taught me as he teaches his own sons, as his grandfather first taught him. Pialik uses the coral to represent the 15 principal stars. As they rise in the east, and set in the west, they mark out 32 points on the horizon. So to my disappointment, Pialig, the ship went off to another island, came back three days later. Pialig said, I'm, I'm out of here. <laughs> I'm leaving. Yeah, he, was, he took his wife and his youngest son, went to Saipan, and said, I'll be back in a month or a month and a half when the next ship comes. But meanwhile, you study with my brother, Urpa. And at first, I was pretty disappointed because there I was with my master, my teacher. Urupa, as it turns out, was a godsend. He's, uh, he went through the same training that Pialik did, so he's a full navigator. He was never initiated in the Poe ceremony, uh, but he spoke very good English. 
and a very gentle soul. He was just, we became very good friends. Uh, so he taught me immediately. I mean, that first night, we sat down, we started studying stuff. I mean, all the anthropologists said, you won't learn any of this for six months. You know, be prepared for that. And there he was, right in the thick of it. So having manual skills was very handy. Um, and the first task at hand was to take apart the boat, our sailing canoe, and uh, re-caulk it. So you caulk it with breadfruit sap and, uh, and, and coconut husks, and then you lash it back together with senate fiber rope, and then caulk it. Now, I had brought a bunch of sailcloth, and they said, we need a new sail, so why don't you make us one? So, you know, I got out the Chinese hand crank sewing machine, I'd worked in the sail loft, so I knew a little bit about it, and I cut a really flat sail because the other sails were really baggy. And all the old guys came by and said, ah, we don't, make, we don't make sails that way. So you can imagine, you know, everybody, the whole village is looking at you and you're sewing away like mad, you know. And then the first night, you know, we pull out the canoe, out of the canoe house, we're gonna go off and fish this offshore reef for tuna. And I'm really nervous, how is my sail gonna perform? So off we go, skid the canoes down, we take off, there's three of them. And uh, you know, right out of the box, the head rips out. So they all look at me like, oh yeah, <laughs> you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> so I'm like, oh my God, what do I do? So I lash it back and we take off and we go fish for the day. And then coming back, the wind really picks up and I'm looking at the head of the sail and my patch is holding. We just waxed the other boats, absolutely killed them. So I was like a big hero. And I don't know that I deserved it, but you know, you take all the advantages you can. So <laughs> that's, that, that really got me, you know, like I was top drawer after that. So rising and setting points of the stars, and then, so that gives you, theoretically, a way to use a star compass at night. During the day, use the swells. There's eight swells. Of course, the swells, uh, you know, you're in the trade wind region, so the swells generated by the trade winds are consistent in their direction. You check it at the morning, in morning and evening against the stars. And so they use the swells and also the, the knots, so they call it bogobo, where the two swells come together, they form knots. And you can, if you really observe it, and it take, it's hard, but I finally got it, you can see the knots, the swells and the knots lining up. So you maintain your direction, the direction of the canoe is consistent to both the swells and the knots. So obviously, this is not something you can do on your iPhone. You know, it takes years of training and really acute observation to make this navigation system work. So now, theoretically, you've got rising and setting points of stars. You can keep your direction during the day. You need charts. There's no charts. So what do you use? You use something called Wofanu, which literally means to gaze at the island. And you learn these in long chants. And again, like Pafu, you practice it again and again and again and again because it's all mnemonic. You've got to remember all this stuff even when you're at sea and you're sick and you're tired and, and you're a little bit confused. And you'll see that later from clips from the film. So these, the wolf I knew is, the chant is I sit on Sadawal, I go rising my lap on truck, I sit on truck, I go setting my lap on Sadawal, I sit on Sadawal, I go uh, rising Paifung, uh, or Terazad on Pulawat, I sit on Pulawat, I go setting Sadawal on, uh, on uh, Tabula Paiur, and so on. So the extent of your voyaging range is, uh, is coextensive with how much wolf fanu you know. And so when I asked, when I recorded all of uh, Urupa and Pialik's wolf fanu, it extended all the way to Hawaii and, Southern, and, and South America. You know, I don't, he said, I, where'd you learn that? He said, I learned it from my great grand, or my grandfather who learned it from his great grandfather. Who knows? Uh, so now you need an organizational framework. You can't plot it. I mean, in the old days before GPS and, and, and electronic plotting, we used to have plotting sheets, right? So we'd work out our sun lines and our star lines and we'd advance our sun lines and we'd, you know, ad, and we'd check our DR positions you know, on our plotting sheets. Well, the plotting sheet that they use is called ETOC, which literally means stage. What's interesting about this is that the canoe is seen to be to be stationary and all the islands, the departure island, the target island, and the reference island are all moving. So you picture the canoe staying there and the whole sea is moving around you. And the way you track your progress along the track is by these array of stars, this picket of stars that line up through the reference island. So this is an actual attack configuration for West Fayo. This is a commonly made voyage, about 40 miles. It's a close reach on the way up. It's a beam reach. Tech 
the, you know, if you got good wins on the way back. They do it all the time. I'll show you some shots of West Fly in a sec. And Lamatrack, which is a real island, is the reference or the Luponk. And um, so what's interesting about this voyage is that the first stage, the attack of sighting, is where the setting Altair um, intersects through, uh, through Lamatrack. And it's where the, only on this voyage, by the way, uh, is that's the point at which Sadawal is no longer visible. And then the second stage is the attack of birds. That's where the birds fly out during the day, fish for the day, fly back. So often if you're approaching an island and you don't know where you are, which is, you know, it's fairly common not to have an exact, you know, bearing on your island, you'll drop sails and wait for the birds to fly back for the day and then confirm, you know, your position and fly back. So you've got attack configurations for all the islands in your voyaging range. And then on top of that, you've got sailing directions. So this one, for example, is Sadawal to Lamatrek. Uh, you check your current as you depart just by backsiding. Same technique that we use or used to use before GPS. And you see what the current's doing to you. It's called Fatona Muir uh, to determine current. Then you know whether you take a northerly track or a southerly track. So again, this is all, it's like athletic knowledge. I mean, you can't teach it. You have to be at sea and learn it. And, and memorize it. So it's really interesting. From a navigational standpoint, it's really interesting. Uh, here's a tack configuration for Picolot, which is upwind. It's a tough voyage because generally it's dead into the wind. And then the run home is pretty easy. And this is uh, Sadawal to Puluat as well. So there are a number of other systems. Iti Matau is the name of the seaways. So in the, in the past, Sorcerers from a rival clan would cast a spell on you if they knew where you were going to, tr to kill you at sea. So, so, the, so the name of the seaways was secret. So you could say, you could talk about the seaway but not the voyage. Uh, and then Pui Pui Matau are brother seaways and you know the bearing, you know the, the course of these seaways. So if you forget one, you can remember the brother. There's another called Arua, which is a parrot fish that swims all through the islands and it leaves Sadawal and it goes on a certain star course and hits a target island and continues through the whole archipelago. Another mnemonic device. Also, these are poetic, they're beautiful, and they're recited in long chants. And then there's Morel et Feu, which is the fighting of stars. Certain stars, when they break the horizon at dawn, fight, and they cause bad weather. So, you know, this is a serious weather forecasting. Uh, you know, you can't pull out your iPhone and, you know, check the weather. So. That's what they use. So they're extremely observant about all natural signs. There's another one called Food Tower, which is ranges, you know, pretty similar. You know, we use ranges all the time uh, to get into, uh, you know, get into atolls where you got to go through the reef if you don't want to wait until the morning um, to go in by sight. So there's Food Tower for all these different islands. So. All, I had already learned more than I ever thought that I would ever learn. And then there was one system I really wanted to, to crack. So I asked Urupa, what about Pukuf? He said, how do you know about that? I said, well, I read about it in the books. Again, the experts had said, nobody will ever teach you this. Forget about it. So Pukuf is an array of sea creatures uh, around an island. They're called individually epar, which means to aim or to fix. And they were placed in the sea by uh, Anuwerasi or Yaluluwai, the god of the spirit of voyaging, to help the navigator when lost. So we spent a lot of time. I said, okay, look, so if you're on Sadawal and you go out to this rising uh, little dipper course and you see a swordfish, is that Pukuf? He said, no, you won't see it. So it's like, well, I don't get it. Is it there? Yeah, it's there, but you won't see it. And finally, I finally said, look, so if you take a buoy, he said, what's a buoy? told him what a buoy is, and you place it there. And then you go back and you find the buoy. He said, wow, yeah, I guess that, that, would, that would be true. There, that you would have to, the swordfish would have to be there. He said, look, we don't go looking for this stuff. If we're lost, then we see it. And now we know where we are because the spirits of navigation put it in the sea to help us when we're lost. And it, you know, so it's really interesting. <laughs> And, and there's Puku for all the different islands. Now there was one final, it's not really a system, but it's a language. It's a series of poems called Itong. And Puitok was Urpa and Pialeg's father because he adopted him when their biological father died. So I wanted to learn Itong and I knew this guy knew it. And I said, so will you teach me Itong? And he looked at me like, 
how do you know about that? And I said, I read about it. He said, well, you're Pialik's brother, and uh, technically you're my son, so I can teach you. So he came into my hut with his wife. We closed all the shades and all the doors, and I handed him, a, um, I handed him a, my, my recorder, and he recorded Etong. Here's what it sounds like. Handful of Etong. And Etong, I said, what's Etong? He said, Etong is known by people who are repi. What's repi? Repi is wise. So if you're wise and if you're a navigator, you're, you're, if you're a navigator, you're by definition wise. And if you're wise, then you know Etong. And if you don't know Etong, then you're not a navigator or wise. <laughs> and and, and so, I, so we talked about how do you use it? He said, well, it's generally for conflict resolution because you've got an island that's a mile long, half a mile wide, 600 people live there. At some times in its past, a lot of people have lived there. So um, the competition for resources is fierce, and you have to cooperate or else kill each other off. Both things have happened over the course of history. Um, so I said, how would you use Etong? He said, well, if there's a conflict, then you go in and you'd, you'd speak this Etong to a chief. And the chief would be compelled to resolve the conflict. So this particular one, which is quite beautiful, is floating leaf swept out, floating leaf swept back, the leaf of the Tong tree, the leaf of our love. Before the canoe house, his ears are full of talk. His ears are full of talk. So what that means is this, this I never was able to identify it, but the pea plant turns orange during certain seasons of the year. Orange is the color of wisdom. So it floats out from the canoe house. So wisdom has left the island. Then it floats back. And then you take the, 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 the leaf to the, the etong takes the leaf to the chiefs. The chief's ears are full of talk, so he's compelled. That means the etong. He knows the etong, so he's compelled to resolve the problem. And it goes on. There's spirits that come into it that help resolve this issue. There's the, the canoe of dark stomach which is the seat of knowledge is empty, it doesn't have the, the light of, of wisdom in it, and so on. So these chants are really beautiful. And really, you know, it's, it's, look, this is a Naval Academy. Nobody has heard this outside Sadawal ever that I know of, because I have all the recordings. But you can imagine a society in which everything is generated by the sea. The ethics, the language, the songs, the chants, uh, where they came from. They all came from the sea. Some of them came from dolphins, the meeting of the union of dolphins and humans. I mean, for, for a naval officer, for somebody who's interested in the ocean, this is one of the most interesting societies that you can imagine. Everything comes from the sea. Anyway, so. That came, that was at the end of my first trip to Sadawal. I was, I was out there for six months the first year. I got word from Pialik that he wasn't coming back. I was supposed to meet him on Saipan, which I did. And we went through all this stuff. And uh, I recorded all of his Etong. I mean, I recorded, he, I asked him about Etong. He said, I don't know it, which perplexed me. But turns out he did. He just wouldn't tell me. Um, so we reviewed all this stuff. Then I went home and came back the next year. And you know I'd done a lot of book learning, but not much voyaging next year. We started right in, it was 84, uh, sailing. And the first voyage was out to West Fayo, that commonly made voyage. And so I got to steer these, one of these canoes. I mean, it was really fun. <laughs> it's just totally fun. West Fayo is an atoll. Uh, it's a tiny little uh, atoll. There's no freshwater lens, so permanent habitation is not possible there. The younger guys call it the island of free lunch, or the island of chow, or the refrigerator, because they can eat as much as they want. So the way you catch fish on the island is you, uh, you swim along in a big semicircle and you scare fish out of the, their reef holes, and then you drive them into this net, and then you dry them and take them back to Sadawal. So the reef catches more than fish. Uh, this was a Filipino freighter that got off course and ran up on the reef at, I don't know, 15, 18 knots, something like that. It was uh, filled with Toyotas. 
and the Coast Guard out of Guam rescued the crew, and then the Satawalese went aboard. They immediately found the liquor cabinet, got incredibly drunk, and then went down to the cargo decks, and they said, how do you run these things? And the younger guy said, ah, you just turn the key. So crash course, they're, they're crashing Toyota cars and trucks. They crashed everything on the whole vessel. Then they started dismantling it and took the car parts up to truck where they sold them for liquor, of course, and cigarettes. And then a few uh, seats from these Toyotas made their way back to Satawal, and they're out in front of the hut still. So that's the story of that one. Back on Satawal, Piala was building a new canoe. I was the only guy who knew how to run a chainsaw, so that became my job. This is a breadfruit tree. It's kind of like um, mahogany, big tree and split it down the middle, then we split it with um, wedges, and then the rest of it is all hand carved. So like you saw in that first shot, these are hand carved, not, not unlike the way that some of the models are made down there, it was just in the model shop. So you do that with adzes, and then, uh, so the size of the vessel is determined by the base log, the keel log, and uh, you know, you try to find long, relatively thick uh, logs so that you can carve these planks. There's not, they're not steam bent or anything else. They're literally carved into the shape. So that's how you do that. I really wanted to go to Piccolot. Uh, that's that 60 mile upwind voyage. The weather was changing. You know, typical trade wind, wind regime where you got steady winds from the northeast, a little bit of diurnal variation, but not much. But it's getting sort of late, sort of into the season of the doldrums now. And uh, uh, so I sort of prevailed on Piala to do it. He didn't really want to do it, said the weather was great, but he did it for me. So off we went. We had one afternoon of good winds and then light and variables. You can see line squalls coming through here. And it's really hard to keep that etoc configuration going when you're not moving all the time. I mean, motion is really your friend because you can, everything's kind of moving in your head. Um, so he didn't know where he was. We went through one night and you know, a lot of tacking back and forth, light and variables, threatening to knock the rig over and all that stuff. He said, do you have your sextant? I had a Davis sextant for those old timers in the room. That's that plastic sextant that expands and contracts tremendously. As soon as you bring it out in the sun, I mean, the thing just blows up. It's crazy. Uh, but that's what I had with me. So I took some sun lines and I figured out more or less where we were. By that time, he had used uh, uh, Pukuf to figure out a place on the reef. We headed back to Piccolot and the determining, well the interesting thing about Piccolot is there's no fringing reef so you got to bring the boats up on the sand, cover them with palm fronds so they don't blow apart in the sun. And Piccolot is all about catching uh, turtles. And the way you do that is not great if you're a turtle, but um, you swim after the turtle, you sort of manhandle it onto a log and tie it up and then bring it back on land and they get transshipped back to Sadawal. So the taboos, I spent quite a bit of time studying taboos. The taboos mostly are for resource preservation. So they govern what fish you can take, when you can take them, when you can take turtles, wh when to leave the, uh, the, uh, the females that are about ready to, ha uh, to uh, lay their eggs and all that stuff. And so it was mostly about resource preservation. Uh, it feeds a lot of people. So off we went, we had three or four turtles on that trip and another case of reverse technology here. This is the oil pan of a Taiwanese fishing boat that went up on the reef and still serves as the, as the, as the galley stove. <laughs> and then back on Sadawal, uh, Venus and the moon setting there. So that brought to a close my second fieldwork season. That was another five months. I went back to Boston and wrote the book. That was published in 86. And then by chance was able to put together the film. So the footage you'll see here is from the film. 1988 was the adventure series. I went out in 87, set it all up. We returned in 88 and actually sailed from Satawal to Saipan in that new vessel that you saw us cutting the base log for. 500 miles, we had a film crew. So by the way, this was back in the day when film was film. So it was, was pre-video, so we had two cameras and a whole bunch of film stock and you know, it was with the clapper and it's, uh, it, it was really cool. It was, it was the last of the documentary film days because shortly after that, the video cameras became robust enough that you could take them out in the field, but they weren't then. So this was film. 
So here's the reunion. Where do uh, most of the people live on this island? We live right. It's called the face of the island. It's that. It's that. It's from about a quarter of the way down all the way down. I lived and voyaged with him over the course of two years. He taught me how to listen to the talk of the sea. And now, years later, he invited me back to join him and his crew on a special voyage. His name is Mao Piailu. I never thought I'd be able to do the film, but we, we, we pulled it together. Uh, so we shot on the island for maybe a week. Uh, this is cutting tuba, making tuba as the alcoholic drink. <clears throat> it's fun, funny how about sailors and alcohol. I don't quite get the connection, but it's a mysterious thing. So uh, you collect the palm sap, you let it ferment for <laughs> four hours or so. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, yeah, and the Navy actually taught him about something they called yeast. So this is World War II. So you're historians. Claude, you should do a demonstration, a live demonstration on this for the museum. So you take bread yeast and whatever else you have, and the yeast kicks off alcohol, and you drink it. It is awful, but it gets you drunk. So I mean, maybe you should have a yeast party here. <laughs> no, he's saying no. I don't think so. Anyway, so that's uh, tuba. And uh, we did some stuff about boat building. This is Uka, one of the old boat builders. Uh, we'd, it's amazing. You drink the tuba and your dancing gets really good. You know, <laughs> traditional dancing. <laughs> and some of the folks were not as excited about the documentary film crew. And um, then showed the preparation of food for voyaging. The traditional food for voyaging is called mar. And it's pounded breadfruit that's wrapped in coconut uh, bre uh, banana leaves. And it lasts for three or four days, and that's about it. So um, then off we went. Uh, so the first stage in any trip to Saipan is to go to West Fayo. And here, here's that departure. Hello. <laughs> 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 It is after dark before we finally go out to the waiting canoe. No stars are to be seen, and I wonder how Mao will steer on the 40-mile passage to the tiny atoll of West Fayu, staging point for voyages to Saipan. <laughs> We steer north toward the point where the Little Dipper sets. Mao tells me he follows a slight swell from the rising star Altair, but it's so slight I can hardly feel it. Yet just after daybreak, we make a perfect landfall. So we were on uh, West Fire for three days, uh, watching the weather mostly. Um, and the weather was, it was entering one of these really strong north wind regimes. And uh, so we did uh, more Eli Fu, we did uh, observation technique where you look at the clouds at sunrise and sunset and determine what the wind's going to do by how fast the uh, cumulo cumulonimbus band descends. Um, and Piali decided we should just go now because the weather was going to deteriorate. And if we didn't go now, then we were going to get pinned there by strong northerlies, which happened. Uh, so off we went. And um, on the fourth day, uh, the wind increased. You'll see in some of this footage here how much the boat moves. These are very active boats in a seaway. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. Um, we got lost, and we didn't know where we were exactly. And here's what it looks like. This turns out to be Rota. And here's what it looks like where you can't, when you can't figure out where you are. You'll see how tired he looks in these shots here. 
By the fourth night, the strain of fatigue is showing. While the rest of the crew sleeps, he confides in me he's uncertain of our exact position. We're now in the bowl formed by Saipan, Guam, and the islands between. This makes the seas lumpy and hard to read. Sleep deprivation has made his memory, his only guiding chart, shaky. But then, his confidence seems to return. If it storms tonight, and the wind turns strong, we will return to sail under the star Polaris. I don't know if the wind will get stronger, or we'll see a little storm. But if not, then we'll spear Saipan halfway between Ulithi and Wule at tomorrow night. Today, we're not where we thought we'd be. We're puzzled. We see an island, but we're not sure which it is. Malcolm thinks it's Rhoda. We must have sailed far slower than we thought, but perhaps there's a current following the strong northerly winds. So it was Rhoda, and we tried to weather the eastern end of Rhoda, couldn't, so we turned around and went around the western end. By that time, he knew where he was. The wind had freed up a little bit, <clears throat> and so it was pretty much a big romp into Saipan, and here's landfall. Landfall is a strange time for a sailor. You're still of the sea, and not quite of the land. The scent of it teases you. According to custom, you must approach an island, its chiefs and spirits, with respect, so as to enter its spiritual fields of power gracefully. For the last five days, and over the course of six years, I've been a voyager in their culture. Now, the young men of Satawa are going to become voyagers in mine. I know that upon reaching shore, everything will be different. The film crew has a schedule to keep. The people of Saipan are waiting to honor Greg as their hero. We will dissolve as a crew, and the fragile moment of our camaraderie will roll away and be lost, like the thin wake of a canoe at sea. So that was the last time I saw Pialig, and after that, many changes came into effect. Um, westernization has continued apace. A lot of these shots are literally archival because uh, these guys are these guys are all grown up now, um, and it's all it's all changed. It's all these guys are all dead. Samwer, Eowiyang, Otalig, <coughs> Ramai, and Ikugun, all gone now. So in a very real way, I mean, I, I, and Pialik died in 2010. So, you know, I was there at this really magical window at the very end of these guys' lives when they realized that if they didn't teach it to somebody, it was just going to disappear. And so in, in every real way, it was the last navigator. Thank you. I know some of you have to go. Uh, others can stay. I appreciate it. <laughs> So Mids and Fatten, don't worry, we'll get you out in time for class. We need to leave now. Go ahead. But we've got about five minutes. Well, I'll be around afterwards. I mean, I don't have to go to class. No. <laughs> I'd like to. <laughs> Anybody have any questions? Come on. It's a naval academy. Did you ever get seasick? Sorry? Did you ever get seasick? No, but uh, what I didn't show you was the night before we took off on the West Fire Boy, I mean, on the uh, Saipan Voyage, they, we had a big feast. And they served dog, <coughs> among other delicacies. And <coughs> I didn't, just for future reference, dog's not really good on the digestive system. But <laughs> no, I didn't. <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> That's pretty bad. Uh, but I didn't, no, I didn't get seasick. 
I mean, the boats really move. You can see in those shots. I mean, they are very active in a seaway. And uh, they're fun to sail, though. They're really fun to sail. How fast do they go? Eight knots? Or well, no, they do a little bit better. Uh, the, the trimaran, it was a brown sea runner trimaran. So um, he said he had a hard time. that Last night going into Saipan, he had a hard time catching up with us. You know, he had to really press it to, to stay up with us. Um, so they'll probably do 9, 10, I'd guess. I mean, if you really press them, they'll do 10. But, you know, you start to pull the boats apart. They're lashed together with senate, you know, with coconut fiber rope. So you don't, you, they could drive them much faster than they do, but the problem is they'll fall apart. Yes, sir. Yeah, you may have said it earlier, uh, the, the, the uh, dimensions of the boat, uh, beam and length, and how many people are on it again? Uh, I didn't give the dimensions. It's all proportional. Um, in the book, which is still in print, there, there are specific proportions, okay. um, length to beam to so on. A lot of it depends on what wood you can get because you have to go find the wood. Uh, typically, there's about six people on the boat. You can't sail them with, you can sail them with four, that's tough. Six is ideal, eight's better. So it takes a lot of manpower to, to sail them. Do they have any way to distill water or do they carry their water? No. No, there's nothing. I mean, uh, coconuts, big water jug, uh, that's about it. So um, there's one etong that is simply, it's a, it's a one stanza chant, and it's about a navigator who gets to an island who's starving, who finally finds an island. I mean, they, they used to get lost a lot, you can imagine. And uh, they're all skinny and starving, and uh, they would give the chant. Uh, and that would impel the chief on the island that they found to feed them. But if he was too weak to say anything, he would just take a coconut shell uh, and turn it upside down, meaning empty. So it, it was tough. One, Piala got lost. Uh, no, he got, he went up on the, he went up on Pick, Pick a lot, in a big, I mean, it was just before a typhoon, and all, I think it was two boats, and they got wrecked there. And this is before any, you know, there was no, there's no communication. And I said, and it was six months. They were on the island for six months. I said, wow, were you skinny when they found you? He said, no, too fat. Because they were eating turtle and <laughs> coconuts and stuff like that. So, you know, Claude and I were talking about asymmetrical warfare before. And, um, you know, one of the interesting things that Claude pointed out is, if you got, you, you know, we think we're tough. We're not tough. We are just such wimps. These guys are really tough. And you know all of the Navy's adversaries out there are probably just as tough as these guys. But you really come to appreciate that when you sail with them and you realize what a wimp you are. <laughs> really. So, yes, sir. So you talked about um, their, their knowledge of distant uh, of destinations and it passed down through generations. Were there other, um, uh, other communities or um, tribes in other islands regionally that they had uh, uh, some kind of communication with, that had similar systems of navigation? Well, probably, the na you mean historically? Historically. <laughs> yeah, probably, you know, we, we don't know, but there's only a couple ways to do it. Like the Marshall Islands, for example, have those stick charts that you see from the Marshall Islands. They represent uh, wave refraction and reflection, but that's all pretty much you know, you're in a, a fairly closed-in archipelago where you can actually use refraction and reflection. So the stick charts, there was no system, there was, they were not systematized at all. So each navigator would use those stick charts as a mnemonic to remind him of the reflection and refraction patterns. So they use that, but it's, it's probable that the Polynesians use similar techniques. I mean, there's, there's, there's only so many ways you can skin a cat. Yes, sir. So they didn't pass down the knowledge to their offspring because of the westernization of GPS and stuff like that? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, I mean, now, you know, after this, uh, you know, the younger guys would go off to high school and then they'd go to college and some of them would go to, they work for the government and they work in <clears throat> on Saipan or Guam or someplace. And they'd save enough money for a ponga, you know, one of those big, you know, 20 foot. Uh, Yamaha makes them, a couple other, they're great big skiffs, gigantic skiffs with, you know, like 40 horsepower Yamahas, hand pull start Yamahas. And, you know, with a Ponga and two guys or three guys, you can, 
and GPS, psh, you can get to West Value in an hour. <laughs> so that's, that's displaced it. Um, you know, it takes a lot of, and what's happened, the downstream effects of that are that you think about all the social cohesion that has to happen to build a canoe house, to maintain a canoe house, to build a, a canoe, to sail a canoe, to maintain a canoe, and so on. And uh, in the hierarchy and the uh, transmission of skills uh, and traditions from the navigator to those who want to learn. I mean, if you present a faster, easier, you know, non-labor intensive technology, I mean, think about it, you got to eat, so you're going to go to West Value in an hour if you can and feed your family. So that breaks down all the social cohesion devices uh, that, you know, uh, adhered, um, inhered tr uh, traditionally on these islands. So there was, there was a big change after I left, and in fact, <clears throat> the guy, Thomas, who, who helped me translate all this stuff, married the really pretty girl. They went, they live on the big island of Hawaii, and I'm still in touch with them. We talk, and every time I find something in the archives, I'll send it to him. And uh, he said, it's just, you wouldn't even want to go back now. It's just so, so different. So it's a shame. Yes, sir. Oh, cut. All right. See ya. We've got to let the uh, mids and the faculty get into the class. All right. Thank you, Thank you all very much.